Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, everyone. We are very honored tonight to have Anne Kranz with us as our speaker. And Anne Kranz is a writer of fiction and essays from Alexandria, Virginia. He is the author of Meditations on the Mother Tongue and has appeared in Southern Humanities Review, The Literary Hub, Gargoyle Magazine, Carolina Quarterly, and elsewhere. He has received notable work distinctions from the Best American Series and nomination for the Pushkar Prize. Thank you so much, Antran, for being uh, with us tonight. But before we hear from Antran's, uh, Antran, sorry, it's uh, our uh, curator, Chen Xing, is going to tell us a little more about Antran. Thank you. Thanks, Adriana and Annie. Um, thank you everyone for coming to this third and final installment of Making Visible series on Asian American Buddhists. I'm going to switch the gallery view so I don't have to just look at myself. Um, you know, I was trying to think on how I met you, and I think we actually emailed about five years ago. I think I might have written a piece in Lions where and you wrote to me. Um, and I was remembering too reading your short story, Once I Wed a White Woman during that time. And um, I actually, you know, on came back into my consciousness, I guess, early this February when he wrote a really thought provoking piece in Lit Hub on how a poetry collection masquerading as Buddhist scripture nearly duped the literary world. And I remember this line on in it, you write, you know, you call yourself a writer of short stories, a Vietnamese American raised in Mahayana Buddhism and an armchair historian of early Buddhist texts. And immediately I was just like, I want to hear more. I want to learn more from you. So that's an article that I definitely recommend to people and as well as An's book, Meditations on the Mother Tongue, um, which there's just so much in here, you know, estrangement, language, Buddhism, parkour, which An does, magic, parents, shame, faith, um, just uh, there's a lot of richness in there. And I could say much more actually, but I'm just really, really thrilled that Ann has taken the time out of a very, very busy work schedule to share with us today. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Ann and then there will be time for Q&A afterwards, but the floor is yours, Ann. Now, thanks to check your name um, thank you, Jensen, for um, thinking of me for the series, and, and thank you, Annie and Adriana, for uh, hosting, and everyone for coming. Uh, as a like writer of like indie fiction, <laughs> uh, it's it's fun to to just do events that are more geared towards um, some of my broader interests that inform the, the creative works and, uh, and particularly when it comes to the Dharma. Um, I think it's, uh, oh, I'm, I'm just honored to be here, really. Uh, Chen Xing and David Great gave some really great talks on um, Asian representation and the lack thereof in the American Buddhist community. And all of this is really, really wonderful work. I'm going to focus a little bit more on what I perceive and I think what the American culture has generally perceived as this shortcoming or a series of shortcomings in the way that the Dharma has been transmitted to the West. Um, and uh, start sharing my screen now. Change my setup a little bit. Um, so I'm calling this working towards a decolonized American Buddhism with the caveat that Buddhism, when it like entered China, it took centuries before a really um, strong understanding of the Dharma resulted in, in that land. So this process is going to take a while and it's only been 
a little over a century. Um, two centuries for uh, since Western contact, um, probably about over a century for um, for American Buddhism from from the Asian and and this conversation is it, it's still very nascent. Um, but uh, first. I uh, just to give everyone a little bit of background on my experience with Buddhism. I, I was raised Buddhist. My family temple is in Houston. This uh, this is a the statue pictured here is from this uh, temple that's just outside of Houston. It's 72 feet tall. A few days ago, I, I made the claim that it's, it was the largest Buddhist statue in the Western Hemisphere, and I double-checked that. It is now the second largest, as far as I can tell. It's 72 feet tall. Um, there's a Russian statue that it, of Maitreya built in 2019 that was, um, I think, 44 feet tall. There's one in Edmonton of Amitabha Buddha, um that is 50 and then there's a statue of Chakamuni in brazil that is um twice like twice as tall as this so it was like 124 feet or something <laughs> um but i grew up in alexandria and went to um dual wagon in uh around the fort belleville area i know a lot of this community or at least the making visible community is from the DC-ish area. So um, this is like around like Telegraph Road or Backlick Road. Um, and it, while I was growing up, had a very close association with um, Bonte Gunaratnas or Bonte G's uh, Bhavana Society, which is a very popular Terrabon Retreat Center in West Virginia, like right, right on the border. Um, and our temple would host, uh, like basically serve as like spillover residency when, when um, that retreat was, or retreat center was really filled up or they were doing renovations. So we were pretty accustomed to a steady influx of, um, white Western convert monks within the community. Um, and then in college, I kind of pulled away from my tradition or the tradition I was raised in and started exploring other traditions, mostly through um, convert lineages because that's all I could find in English. And I had lost my ability to speak or really understand most of Vietnamese. Um, and then it probably took me about 10 years to come back into the Vietnamese tradition, um, which I say around like 27 or so, um, but that's where I'm in now. And I realized I didn't put where I am now, but I'm in the Bay Area. And um, I do want to talk a little bit about this lineage just because Making Visible is connected to the Thich Nhat Hanh lineage. Uh, so some of you have probably seen this uh, chart before. And the tradition that, the meditative tradition that I'm uh, most accustomed to comes from a sister lineage, uh, which diverged just about a hundred years from Thich Nhat Hanh's, and it um, all connects back to uh, Thu Hiu Monastery in Wei. Um, so we're going to go through a little bit of a history lesson, and then um, some discussion about doctrine, and, um, and then some myths that uh, that have perpetuated in the Western Buddhist communities. Um, so I can't really give full context about my relationship 
to Buddhism and imperialism without talking about the Vietnam War a little bit. And in particular, this man, uh, Dai Da Wing Bung Yi, who was a high ranking official in the South Vietnamese government under President Yi. Oh, here's a picture of him with, uh, with Richard Nixon, which I find really funny because also all of them in like white suits, I think it's a really, it's trying to present a very particular image. Uh, but uh, Wing Bung Yi, was the director general of the National Police and um, also the director of the CIO. And after the coup with Yim, I'm not, I'm not gonna go through a lot of Vietnamese history, so I'm, I'm going to assume people know like the broad strokes. Uh, after, after the coup, um, Wing Wing Yi, had survived because he just hadn't gone to the office that, that day and then uh, was put into a prisoner of war camp. I want to talk a little bit about some of his actions. Oh, I should have done a content warning. Uh, so my apologies. <laughs> but um, I think most people are aware of the Buddhist crisis. Most people have seen this photograph. Um, but to recap, under Yim, around in 1946, Yim, um, he used this really old uh, executive order statute that, uh, that had been used in the past to uh, attack political dissidents and, and basically use that authority to start rounding up Buddhists under the suspicion or just the outrageous claim that Buddhists were communists. And um, in uh, so the Buddhist crisis really gets off in 1963, uh, when Visek is coming up and Yim effectively bans the flying of the Buddhist flag. Uh, there are mass protests and then uh, the national police or Arvin, but uh, I think this is normally credited to the national police. Someone opened fire into the crowd. Light ammunition, not rubber bullets, and um, nine people died. And then Yim uh, responded to this by saying that there were effectively agitators among the protesters and that justified killing these civilians. Uh, just a month later, because the protests just keep on piling up and his reactions and the government's reactions to these protests are um, not, not well received. Um, people are spilling out into the streets. And once again, national police are deployed. The army is deployed. They fire um, gas into the crowd and then start pouring chemical acid on um, people on a bridge who were just kneeling and praying in protest. So one of the reasons I bring this up is because I want to point out first that um, the whole goal of the enterprise of propping up this the illegal state could be, you have to keep in mind that there was an election that had been agreed to, uh, and then it was canceled by the Americans. <laughs> And, and by the South government, because they, they knew they would lose, basically. And it's only democracy if your side wins. Right. The other reason is because um, Wing Bung Yi is my grandfather, or my, technically my great-grandfather, um, but he, he took my mother in, raised her, and 
while I'm going through this talk, um, I just want to point out that our relationships to imperialism are incredibly complex. And um, everyone has perpetuated white supremacy in, in different ways without, uh, without realizing it. And if any of that sounded familiar, like, uh, it's, it might be hard to, to look at this situation and think, oh, what does this particularly have to do with white supremacy uh, other, other than that, the colonial aspect. But um, the reason I kept saying that he was around or accusing these communist protesters of effectively anti-fascism, one, because that's what they were. They were protesting a fascist dictator. Two, there is still a problem with fascism in this country or in among the Vietnamese in this country. And they will sidle up to white supremacy and ally with it because they ultimately um, cling to these narratives that have been sown. Uh, now, there's another reason I bring up Wing Bun Yi. And it's because of this, um, this context. I'm not going to read through it, but effectively, after Yim was deposed of, um, my grandfather was very well treated in the POW camp because of his record. And uh, while he was there, he was just like, okay, I'm going to study Taoist magic. And he got really good at it to the point where he accurately predicted two, uh, Wing Lung Tu's um, electoral win like a year or two in advance and then became Tu's like personal astrologer. So when I uh, approached the study of Buddhism from like an Anglophone context, um, I was coming from a background where magic in my childhood, in my family, was a normalized thing. Right? Um, different people were astrologers or geomancers or numerologists. Uh, I would have aunts and uncles who could see ghosts. And um, these are just stories we passed along. So when I encountered the um, like two Buddhisms typology of this uh, Western Buddhism that is rationalist and text-based and meditative versus a very superstitious Asian Buddhism as a teenager. And then going back to my, my mom or my dad and asking questions about Buddhism and all they could do was say, this is, this is stuff that monks know. Um, normal people don't care. Uh, it it sort of corroborated this this um, structure of oh well my parents don't seem to really know that much about Buddhism even though they they appear to be quite faithful um, and I sided with the Western rationalist camp and that was the Buddhism that I. Um, studying and what was most interested in. But as I kept studying, I took that idea of um, like looking for the oldest text. Uh, and I started seeing problems with the texts that were coming out of, uh, that were being marketed to, to Westerners because because I wanted to read the original sources. And when I got there, I started to see holes in the way that this had been presented. So um, I want to say that there is a specific religious orthodoxy in the doctrines, in the text, where you have all of these schools, but there's not as much sectarianism as the West and as Western scholarship wants us to believe, there's really two 
three-ish um, different like commentarial traditions. One being the Theravadan, which uh, extends from Buddha Gosa. And then the other two are the uh, East Asian Mahayana and the Central Asian Indo-Tibetan traditions. And both of these are effectively some form of a Yogacara Majyamaka Tathagata Garbha synthesis, um, which is a lot of complex words. Um, but uh, my, my main point is that all the traditions pretty much agree a lot more than, than we think. Uh, and every time the, that the Dharma has encountered another culture, we are told that it changes to that culture, but I think that's really just an excuse to not understand other cultures because they superficially look different. Um, Shinto gods look different than like uh, Chinese folk gods, but, uh, but the six realms are accepted in every culture that is Buddhist. And anytime it enters those cultures, it just absorbs that their cosmology into Buddhist cosmology. Uh, so the, the argument that it changes, it, it's just not true. And it's a very superficial understanding of Asian cultures in general, because to, I'm not saying there are no differences between these cultures, but I am saying that the Buddha Dharma does not really alter itself. Uh, what it does is recontextualizes the other culture within the dharmic framework. And it's, it's powerful enough to absorb absolutely anything into itself because, um, I mean, what we've asked me, it's because it's right. But, but uh, it, it's, that's a bias to you. I, I feel like the argument that it changes in response to other cultures as a defense of Western secularism in Buddhism is really just um, someone who's trying to shut down the conversation without supporting their arguments. Because it's all, all they really do is just point to these other cultures and say, look how different they are. Um, but if you ask them to really dig into it, they're, they haven't really thought it through, I don't think, people who hold on to this, this argument. Uh, and repeating again that uh, synchronization with the West is, is still very young. So it's gonna take a long time and there's going to be a lot of debates, but I want to establish, there are certain viewpoints that are fundamentally incompatible with the Buddha Dharma uh, across all traditions, which is essentialism, the idea that any, anything has an essence that can endure. Uh, physicalism, the idea that material reality is the fundamental um, core or, or root of all phenomena and creationism, uh, which uh, we're, we're all pretty aware of. I have this quote here from the Kondavya Sutra, mostly just because I think it's funny. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, the Bhagavad told the deity Maheshrava, uh, which is a name for God, essentially, or the like highest God. Maheshvara, in the Kali Yuga, when beings have had bad natures, you'll be declared the primal deity who is the creator, the maker. All those beings will be excluded from the path of enlightenment. Uh, it's a very polemical assertion, but this is Buddhism. Like there are 2,500 years of commentary about why it is logically impossible for a creator God to exist. Um, um, so how did we get to a point where you have saying you can bring creationism into the Dharma and other people saying that materialism is perfectly okay and uh, and scientific rationalism is uh, the ontological view that is like most compatible with the Buddha Dharma. And a lot of this comes from um, movements in Japanese Zen um, around the end of the 
19th century and the beginning of the 20th, or maybe the, maybe, maybe earlier than that. Um, but it was basically, it was towards the end of the Meiji Restoration. And Japan was desperate to modernize. Uh, it, it had seen the century of humiliation in China and, and effectively said, if we don't become technologically and philosophically like the West, that is our fate. So um, one way that they chose to survive was they were watching these um, rationalist polemics against Christianity at the time and uh, thought that the way forward was to appeal to these rationalists by uh, effectively asserting, well, you see all these things you dislike about Christianity, um, Buddhism is superior because it, it has surpassed that phase of religious development and entered this phase of scientific rationalism immediately. But it was a curation of it and it wasn't historical. Uh, David McMahon in the making of uh, Buddhist modernism writes, uh, Buddhism becomes in effect an inverse reflection of what skeptics and liberal Christians believe to be problematic about orthodox interpretations of Christianity. And we start to see the same thing happen in the Theravadan traditions in Southeast Asia. Uh, this I know a little bit more about. <laughs> uh, so this definitely began in the 18th century um, and really began as soon as Western contact happened. Um, a lot of, it, like, like in Japan, it was a movement to, to try to resist um, succumbing to, to Western powers and Western influences. So it was fighting Christianity and it was also fighting um, colonial rationalism who would seek to, to get rid of any religion that it felt was um, superstitious. Uh, so you had these reformers who started innovating and spreading these new ideas that could really appeal to the lay people because they de-emphasized um, a lot of the cosmological aspects and the theoretical aspects, um, but it was still firmly grounded in the Abhidharma. Um, Lady Sayadaw in Burma is one of the pioneers of the, the Boston reform. And originally everything he taught had a correlation to, to something in the Abhidhamma because it, to him, it was essential. Um, the the Abhidhamma is like a book of metaphysics or uh, phenomenological theory to, in effect, uh, but it also creates maps for, for meditation and, uh, and also just maps for understanding reality and how phenomena and perceived experiences break down into to different dharmas. Um, and then, but once the West took hold of this, like, uh, it really clung to this de-emphasis. And, and I wanna point out here that when, even in Japan and, and in Southeast Asia, when we talk about de-emphasizing these cosmological aspects of the Buddha Dhamma were the original audience was other Asian people who already believed in these things, um, but probably thought they were really boring and didn't really apply to their lives. So when you have a teaching that is more directly pragmatic, it catches on and spreads, but it doesn't dispose of uh, those cosmological views. It just doesn't really pay attention to them. When it comes over to the West, what you end up seeing is 
that without having that cultural background pre-established, de-emphasis becomes outright rejection. And then that rejection is then replaced with the dominant cultural uh, ontological view, which in this country is material physicalism. Uh, but uh, I, I guess I'll get into it later. But uh, my point there is really that it's not a tenable position if you're actually studying the Dharma, because the once you actually get into the weeds of the Dharma, I don't know how you hold on to this idea that reality exists. Um, there, yeah, we, we, there, there's another point here. Uh, so one of the things that happened during the spread of the Vipassana movement in uh, the 1800s and the 1900s is um, this old tradition in Theravada called Boran Kamatana uh, that uh, Kate Crosby has written wonderfully about uh, in a book called Esoteric Theravada, which came out, I think, just, just last year. So uh, very new book. Uh, it's one of the best post-colonial works I've encountered so far because it completely upends our understanding of Theravada history. Uh, but Effectively, there was this old tradition. It was esoteric. And in this context, that means it involves magic and um, working with energy channels in the body. Uh, and because it wasn't understood by Westerners, they didn't really like it. They didn't understand the Abhidhamma, which which these magic systems were also very, very strongly rooted in. Uh, so they, they just considered it part of the folklore of these cultures and um, didn't even really consider it part of the Buddhist lineage. So there was an immense pressure among Buddhist monastics in this area to convert into the Vipassana reform just to stay in their tradition uh, or they would sometimes be forcibly defrocked, maybe by public shaming, because some monks might say things like, um, like we, we need to update, they have guns. Um, like the West was a very real threat. So in some respects, it makes a lot of sense to, transform the religious landscape into something that appeals to the Western sensibilities just as a means of surviving and, uh, and sort of just recognizing the fact that the West had a greater power. Um, one thing I want to point out is that when, we, when the West was privileging these modernist traditions, um, and denigrating um, indigenous traditions, a lot of what they were observing was caused by the violence and the conquests that they were committing. <laughs> so you have people running for their lives. They're not going to be studying scripture. So when uh, uh, so when these people, or when these Western philosophers are, are studying or doing ethnographies of, of uh, Asian Buddhists at that time, of course they can't uh, explain things to you. And this thought and this, this passage in uh, this dissertation, Vietnamese Buddhism in America, of, of these monks who were really, really pushing for um, literacy among lay people to just to hand out pamphlets with liturgies on them so that they could read and chant because they knew that these people could not get to the temple and they wanted some way for these traditions to remain alive while uh, there were constant migrations. And, uh, and when, when I read through all this, I, it just clicked with me like, oh, that's why my parents could never explain anything. They grew up in a war zone. Um, 
And I would say that if it happened in Vietnam in the 50s through 70s, it surely was happening all throughout Southeast Asia because, especially because um, people didn't read back then. I, you know, no, we are the first generation, probably well, the second generation in, uh, in world history where mass literacy is a thing and access to the canons. Um, so it's, it's a very special privilege to be able to read and the ability to understand the Dharma as a lay person, I think is, uh, it's, it's indicative of how special this time is. So uh, another thing I want to point out is that uh, I, I feel like this two Buddhism typology is sort of an echo of what Westerners have read in, in some of the Mahayana works where they're uh, calling out this Hinayana Buddhism, where if you look into, um, if you look into the way that these texts are talking about Hinayana, the doctrines don't actually line up with any particular school. It mostly lines up with the Um but most of the time it just seems like a straw man that, uh, it's just something for them to argue against. And uh, I, I feel like Asian Buddhism has a category among Westerners as this separate thing that is so fundamentally different from their way of doing things. It's really just a construction that allows them to privilege their ideology. Um, so text that really just complains about Westerners. Oh yeah, it's basically a summary. Uh, yeah, let's move on. Oh, but this last point I think is also important that uh, all of this distortion of the Dharma is happening at the same time that the West is invading, murdering, uh, raping, burning down villages, uh, and forcing famines by, by either uh, raising farmlands or just taking it all and shipping it back to Europe. Uh, all of this is happening at the same time. So you cannot take the scholarship of Buddhism at that time in a, you can't read it in a way that is divorced from the ideology of white supremacy that sent them into Asia in the first place. Because at, certainly in the 18th century, that, that, is the, that was the dominant worldview that, um, uh, that the West was going out there to civilize the rest of the world. Um, so this evolves in certain ways that um, that gets propped up by uh, act like explicit white supremacists um, because it began with anti-Semitic roots. Um, David Lopez writes uh, about. And, and speaks about quite often how the construction of the scientific rationalist Buddha was in itself a, supposed to be a foil against Christianity for Europeans who were becoming disillusioned with Christianity. But it wasn't just this disillusioning, um, there was an anti-Semitic core to it. They wanted a spiritual leader who was not a Jew. And the fact that um, the Buddha calls himself an Aryan and, and the neo Nazis sort of latched onto this word Aryan, uh, it becomes fodder for, uh, for right wing extremists. And this is something I don't think enough people in 
in our communities are talking about, especially in the convert communities, because yes, there are Nazi Buddhists. Some of them are very good at hiding, um, but they exist. Uh, th this picture is one of the more prominent cases of a, uh, of a meditation teacher from uh, like the Northwest of Canada. Oops. Uh, who, who became outed as a Nazi and, and then fired, uh, Ryan Ruhi. But there are, there are a lot more than you think. And um, they were very emboldened in like 2015 through 2017, the whole, because everything that was going on in this country. Uh, and they sort of revealed themselves. Uh, and Gleig, has done some great scholarship on, on this subject. I don't know too many others who are, but it is something I think we need to watch out for in our communities. And we need to train ourselves to listen for those dog whistles because they're out there. Um, and uh, they've gotten very good at coding themselves, basically. Um, gotta hurry. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk just a little bit about some of the things I think that may have caused this, um, these misconceptions to arise. Um, so there's this talk on the Plum Village YouTube page. It's been basically delisted, uh, but I bookmarked it like as soon as it came up because when I was listening to it in Vietnamese, I was blown away by how astute and how scholarly uh, Thich Nhat Hanh was. This, this particular talk uh, discusses the six realms and their relationship to the skandhas and how the skandhas affect our perception of the realms. He talks about Nargujana's um, Maha Pragna Paramita Upadisa. Um, and then there's a section on uh, Ya Yi or Wu Wei, I don't know how to pronounce that in Chinese, uh, which is a Taoist concept of uh, inaction. And in the Buddhist context, it refers to um, unconditioned action. So he explains how, how Buddhists have, have appropriated that term into its own context. And, um, and he talks a little bit about the uh, Mahavabhasa of the Sarvastivadins and uh, some of the tensions between the Pragna Paramita traditions and the Abhidharmikas who, who believed that um, external reality was, was real. Um, someone had pointed me to the same talk in English translation and um, when I was listening to that talk, there's a few problems I have. One is this summary, this description of it, um, really just talks about the initial uh, meditation that happens in, in the talk, which is like the first 20 minutes or so of a hour and a half but doesn't really talk about the contents of the talk. Um, and I'm not saying that the translation is inaccurate. The translation is done on the fly. Uh, you can hear you can hear me back and that is really hard to do. So this is not a major criticism. It's pointing out problems of the way we've, we've chosen to, to do these things that, that have arisen. Um, none of the titles of texts, I, if I recall correctly, maybe maybe one title, but certainly not like the Mahavibhasa. Um, and uh, yeah, Ya Yi, there, that entire discussion of casting Ya Yi from Taoism into Buddhism is overlooked because Yagi is just translated as the word in action. And um, 
it's just very, very simplified to the point of, I'm not sure if you learn much Dharma out of it. You learn bits and pieces of broad ideas, but um, the ability to articulate the teachings, uh, I, I feel that gets lost, especially, especially with the titles of texts, I feel. And those are, those are hard to translate. And, um, but, uh, but I, I feel like when we're teaching in English, we, we can't shy away from, from that techno content. I think in the beginning, it may have been because of um, needing simplicity uh, and, and just thinking that Westerners wouldn't care that much. But I think our culture has changed quite a bit. It's been decades since, since that style was first established. And um, I, I would hope that American Buddhists are, are thirsting for something deeper than what they've got. Um, and uh, another problem with this perpetuation of, of these Western ideas of Buddhism is, uh, as mentioned uh, this poetry collection that uh, the Matt Weingeist had, had published, which uh, claimed to be a translation of the Trigata, which is uh, the earliest collection of uh, women's spiritual literature, I think ever, or extent, not ever, but the, the earliest extent work of collected women's literature. I believe there's older works by like one author uh, that record the, the enlightenment, enlightenment gathas of, of the first nuns. But this wasn't a translation. He just published his own poetry and said it was like, I, the first poem of the book is the closest one to an actual translation. And then everything else is almost completely Different. Um, it was uh, Bhikkhuni Aya Sudama from the Charlotte Buddhist Vihara, who who really got the ball rolling on calling uh, Matt Weingeist out for releasing some something that was fraudulently labeled uh, a a translation. And this is a real because he stripped away like basically their awakening, their spiritual powers and, and fundamental concepts of what Buddhism actually teaches in favor of presenting this sort of feel good, inspiring version of the Dhamma that, uh, that comes off a little more like self-healthy and self, like self-empowering than inspiring us to see the true attainments of these noble women. Uh, and that took like all the time I had expected, but really quickly, I wanna go through some of, some of these other misconceptions and I think it'll be, I think they'll be fast. So first is these are three different gods. <laughs> um, I think everyone, most people at this point do know that um, my chair, this, this guy in the middle here, who is often confused for Shakyamuni Buddha is not the Buddha, but a Bodhisattva. Sometimes he is called my chair Buddha. Like don't, I, some people when they, when they hear my chair Buddha will say, oh, he's not a Buddha. Like, things get kind of blurry at that point. Uh, but uh, yeah, so he is a 10th century monk named Budai. There are textual records of this monk. So he was probably a historical person, but he's often confused with this guy to his right, Lahan Bodai, who is a uh, Kotsak Arhat or the Budai Arhat. Um, they look virtually the same, but this is actually supposed to be a depiction of Angita the snake catcher who was one of the 18 arhats who carries around a cloth sack filled with snakes he has defanged. 
Uh, and then on the left here is Umdia, who is the Vietnamese earth god. Um, all of these figures have kind of been conflated together. You'll find a lot of statues with features of both Umdia and, um, and Maitreya together. Like um, this thing that his elbow is leaning on is a gold ingot. So you'll often see um, Udai, the Bodhisattva with like gold coins and stacks of gold and or holding a gold ingot. And it's because of this conflation between these two deities. And if you do see a conflated statue, I, I would say that that statue could pretty much serve both functions depending on what you want. Um, but it is mildly important to know that they're, they are different. Um, the Buddha's hair is not snails. I don't know where this came from. If anyone has any clue, please let me know because I've been searching for like eight years to figure out where this rumor comes from. Um, there's like a 1976 paper that talks about his hair and describes it as curled like a snail shell. Um, but that paper very clearly understands it's, it's, it's his actual hair. Um, but yeah, not snails, it's just curly hair. Uh, the American Buddhist literature, literary tradition begins with, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, this poet named Sadakichi Hartman, who is a Japanese American, and uh, in 1897 published Buddha, a drama in 12 scenes. Um, uh, from what I've been able to look into, I believe this is the oldest work of American Buddhist literature. Um, Someone, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I would love to know if I'm wrong. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so the, the Buddhist literature begins with Asians in the 19th century. Um, oneness is not a Buddhist teaching. This is refuted several times in the early texts and, and later too. Um, I specifically hunted down this, uh, oops, this uh, Thich Nhat Hanh quote, where he pre very much explicitly calls out that we aren't to regard even emptiness as any kind of ultimate or absolute reality, because um, it's normally his quotes that are presented to me in argumentation against this idea. And, uh, and I just, I love that he, he is able to serve up both sides of it. Um, by, by the way, uh, a lot of his works are meant to like convert people who aren't Buddhists, which is, which is why his language can be softer. Um, but it, as, as it gets deeper, you start seeing lectures like um, the one that was screenshotted earlier uh, where he, he gets really deep into the theory, uh, which I think, it, I think it shows that he's a master of skillful means, that he can attract this lar large audience. And then for the people who want to learn more, he'll, he'll let it get a lot deeper. Um, female Chan patriarchs existed. Lay meditation has been a thing for quite a while. Um, there's a patriarch in the Vietnamese tradition, Bhikshuni Yu Nan, um, from the 12th century, who was one of the last um, patriarchs of the Venaruchi school of Tien. Um, Master Ji Yuan Jingang, Chinese Tripitaka, not the Taisho, but a different, uh, different version. Uh, in a hagiography that um, goes over a lot of her accomplishments. Um, and it's recorded there that she had quite a number of lay disciples. So I think that it, it's a pretty interesting note that, that even in the 17th century, you had lay Chinese Buddhists who were studying in uh, Chan monasteries because 
Western scholarship, I think, would have you believe that didn't happen. Um, and I'm not saying there were a lot of lay Buddhist meditators. Um, they were probably quite rare and quite rich. Um, and then uh, added uh, Suda, Hyu Chu An, who uh, is a renowned or was a renowned teacher in, in South Vietnam. It's a picture of her. She was uh, half French on her father's side. Um, another point on this is that, uh, at least in the Vietnamese tradition, um, women in monasticism tend to outnumber the men. I've, uh, I've seen estimates of like a four to one ratio of, of nuns to monks in Vietnam proper. Uh, and uh, yeah, nuns have full ordination rights in, in the Dharmaguptika lineage. And it, it's always been my experience that they've effectively been treated as equals or um, tech, technically it's like Confucian values, I think supersedes the guru dhammas that, that like, in ceremonies, they might they might obey these these linear rules, but I think in actual practice, if a novice monk didn't bow to a senior nun, everyone would be like, "What a jerk!" You know, because <laughs> um, elders are elders, and I, I my cultural sense is that. Um, it doesn't matter what their station is. If they're an elder, you, you respect them no matter what. Um, and a little bit on magic and mantras. Uh, mantras are magical spells. Uh, the word ju in Vietnamese is, the, is originally the uh, Taoist term for a magic spell. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it in Chinese. Uh, and they have, mantras have very specific uh, grammatical structures that allow their, their magic to work. Um, a repeated phrase is a gata or, or like a motto. Um, and a quote here from, uh, I'm not gonna read it. <laughs> Um, Buddhism did not emerge from Hinduism. Hinduism did not exist yet. Um, it came out of these shamanic schools um, and its closest association would be Jainism. The shamanists rejected uh, Vedic authority. Uh, if you wanna read more about this, Johannes Bronckhurst, Greater Magadha, great, is a great work on this. Um, the, among the shamanas, you had like physicalists, materialists who believed that uh, when you die, your parts of your body just return to the earth and the elements, and that was it. You had existentialists. You had um, other people who believed in rebirth and people who didn't. Um, so there were a lot of competing views at that time and quite a broad tapestry of philosophical ideas that are not too unlike um, how it is now. So the idea that is sometimes presented that um, that the Buddha taught a secularist dharma and then the, the surrounding culture infused its other ideas into it is just, uh, it's absurd. And it, it means you didn't read the text, which I, I think is really sort of ironic because um, this is spelled out in the very first text of the Pali Canon. <laughs> it's uh, DN1, where he goes through all of the various views of the time and just says, this is wrong view, this is wrong view, this is wrong view, this is wrong view. Uh, so that is, um, basically the point here is, yeah, all of these, other views existed and the Buddha still taught rebirth. He taught a unique model of rebirth uh, that hadn't existed prior to this. 
so it is it is an early doctrine and is not something that came in later. In fact, Hinduism, or picking back onto this, Hinduism, which did not exist, but uh, Vedic religion at that time did not have rebirth at all. It um, Brahmins were able to ascend and become devas, but everyone else went into this underworld that was um, basically ruled by King Yama. Uh, so it definitely was not a, an idea that came out of the Vedic context. Uh, that actually went the other way around where Vedic religion in its transformation into Hinduism uh, borrowed rebirth and karma from Buddhism and Jainism. Um, and, and this book, uh, Bhikkhu Annihilates, uh, Rebirth in Early Buddhism is also a great text. It also has a cool section at the end that goes over a case study of a young monk who, um, not sorry, a young boy at the time who started chanting in Pali when no one else around him would have known Pali and, uh, and Anilil found that the Pali was even in like this archaic dialect that no one speaks anymore or uses anymore. Um, just, just a really cool little case study. Um, bodhisattvas do not postpone enlightenment. This is uh, sort of a conflation of different ideas. Um, the main one being that um, Mega Bodhisattva in the time of Daipankar Buddha did like think, oh, I could be an Arhat right now, but I want to be a Buddha. So he was deferring one form of enlightenment for another, but that's not the same thing as postponing. And there are, uh, there is a concept called a Bodhisattva Ikantika, which is a Bodhisattva that uh, that won't attain enlightenment, but there's a lot of different commentarial justifications for what a Bodhisattva Ikantika is, if they actually exist, or if it's just like a conceptual idea. Um, this here is a passage from Jan Nachier's A Few Good Men. A glaring example of this error can be found in Carol Meadows' translation of Aryasura's Paramita Samasa. Thus taking into consideration the welfare of the world and being eager to attain the state of a Buddha, he should set about rousing himself to meditation through constant practice of yoga. Oh, that's the, uh, that's the actual line. Meadows, however, translates, thus taking into consideration the welfare of the world without the eager desire to reach the state of a Buddha immediately, he should set out uh, undertaking the meditation by yoga. So this, concept which is i think sort of an easy mistake to make um, just becomes perpetuated until it's it's just everywhere and it's close enough that it's sort of harmless but at the same time uh, it makes talking dharma with certain westerners a little bit difficult if um if they're very insistent on this idea, basically. Uh, I don't have time to read, read this, but uh, basically Pure Land Buddhism is a, like there is a methodology that is meditative. Um, it can lead you through the uh, meditative absorptions and um, not all traditions of Pure Land Buddhism utilize meditation, but not also not all of them are entirely faith-based. So um, a lot of the distaste for Pure Land methods in the West due to their superficial similarities to Christianity. Um, a lot of it comes from only looking at Pure Land through a Japanese lens and uh, which is not to criticize Japanese. Um, but it creates a very narrow view of what Pure Land is. And, uh, and then it makes it harder to, for Westerners to understand how Pure Land fits into the rest of the Mahayana because there's no school of Mahayana that rejects the Pure Land. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh comes like the Duhim Monastery is a Pure Land temple. Um, 
he just didn't think that it would resonate with Westerners, so he de-emphasized it. Um, and this is my last one before questions, um, which is really that Thich Han did not invent engaged Buddhism, which um, I don't think this is also a problematic myth, but I do think it's important to know the tradition. Um, in the 13th century, there was an emperor named uh, Zhang Yantam who loved Buddhism. Like as a young kid, all he wanted to do was be a monk. And um, he, he basically just wanted to ordain and then, and then his dad said, no, you can't, <laughs> the Mongols are coming. Uh, and he had to become king. And his, the court monastic at that time said, uh, basically had convinced him ultimately that he could be the emperor and fulfill his duties and then um, pursue the Dharma afterwards. He didn't really like this, but uh, he fought back in, against the Mongols, won, and after he, uh, after the empire was, or the kingdom was in peace, he abdicated the throne, became a monk, and then became very renowned as a poet and a uh, philosopher. He composed a text called the Gujan Lakdalfu, or engaging the world or dwelling in the joy of Dharma, as it's typically translated. Uh, where he tried to bring together this Confucian ideal of political duty to the nation and to the people with wanting to study and practice the Dharma and trying to reconcile those ideals together. And um, for us, that, for the Vietnamese tradition, is typically where we credit the beginning of um, a politically engaged Buddhism that takes on different forms, but even in this earliest form, it is about resisting imperialist aggression. Um, and I think that was my last slide. Uh, yeah. So hopefully that wasn't too rushed. Um, Thank you, Ann. That was wonderful. Really, so, so much there. Um, I think we have some questions already in the chat, so I'm going to turn it over to Chenzing to um, manage the questions. Thank you again, though. Really appreciate it. Learned so Thank much. You. Thank you, Ann. I think Olabi writes in the chat, wow, and that with many exclamation points after, and that's how I feel and I think how many people feel the way you've been able to weave together the personal, the historical, political, literary, it's all so it gives us such an expansive view. So thank you so much for that. Um, I see a couple of questions in the chat. Let me just read the first one here. It's um, from someone who wants to remain anonymous, who writes, you have upended many of the ideas that I have about Buddhism as a serious practitioner. How would you like the information that you just shared to influence my current practice? What in your view would be a step to take to decolonize my current practice or return to a more authentic practice? Hmm. Is it, that's tough. Um, I get a lot out of trying to study the text as much as I can, but I, I understand that takes a lot of time and, and these works are really dry and boring <laughs> to a lot of people. Um, but I do think we kind of have a duty because we're the first literate laborers like en masse ever that we should be reading primary sources um, as, as much as we can. Um, and there's not a whole lot that are available in English. Like, um, I, I'd say I started seriously reading texts at like maybe 22 and started feeling like I was running out of stuff to read at like 25. Um, so I, I think that that is one way to go about it. But also just, I, 
I think it's okay to go into other Buddhist communities and practice in a space where you don't know the language. Uh, I'm because one contact with the triple roads with anyone wearing the triple roads, I think has a transformative effect on the mind. There's power when someone wears those robes and is um, ordained into the vinya and maintains pure conduct. And that power influences the environment around it. it it's, it's a mini pure land that is generated from, from every monastery. Um, so there's a lot to be said of just devotional practice. I, and I think that, that's one of the main things, um, like leave scriptural study and academic stuff outside. I think the West needs to understand why devotional practice exists in Buddhism and why it's so important. Thank you, that's so powerfully put. Um, here's another question from Claire and I think I'll read a little bit of this intro because I think it's helpful context. Thank you for speaking. I've read some of your work and found it exhilarating. Appreciate your scholarly vocabulary and knowledge that de demonstrates how much many of us have to learn. It's good to think of American Buddhism as a baby with eons ahead. I loved your story about the doomed couple who divorced in the end. It struck me as a very funny kind of flip ending being sharp and critical. I think the question may be here. Um, I'm curious about the range of American Buddhist reactions to your teachings. Well, I'm not comfortable calling them teachings. <laughs> <laughs> or your perspective, shall we say. <laughs> um, I mean, some people, I think there is a general trend right now among Western Buddhists to start there's been a little bit of rejection of, of these old narratives of like a rationalist dharma because they realize something is missing. And I think because a lot of people realize that they're still suffering. Um, and uh, so there has been this general move, I think, back towards trying to find traditionalism um, in, in its various forms. Uh, Pure in Buddhism, I think it's starting to really catch on with Westerners in certain contexts, but it's still an uphill kind of battle. Um, but there, I mean, there's outright hostility too, um, and uh, you know, accusations of clinging too much to race or um, being bigoted towards uh, white people, uh, and it it really. It's a wide range. Uh, I'd say I'd say it's mostly on the extreme ends, <laughs> um, or at least those that that's what I hear because those are the loudest. And I think you're in online space is a fair deal, so I can imagine there can be some polarized reactions there as well. Um, here's a question from Oolabi. Thank you for sharing a light and an energy of great value um, and energy. What are some teachings on reincarnation or are there teachings or culture on ancestry or family that may be left out in Western slash individualized culture? Um, I don't know about specifics on re or I mean, there are some like popular examples of uh, of a uh, Pali text where where the Buddha gives instructions on to a married couple on on how to like reconnect in future lives. Um, that's the that's really the only thing that comes to mind that would fit that. Um, I think rebirth theory and, and its relationship to karma theory would be important to know if from like a philosophical point of view, if that is um, what's desired but in terms of um, like personal familiar relationships and what's like pragmatic 
or useful to, to a layperson in that context? Um, I don't know. It's sort of outside of my uh, focus. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, this is great. There's so many good questions coming in. Um, Sarah asks, would you care to translate the talk by Thich Nhat Hanh that would give more clear content to a reader? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully somebody does, even if it's not you, you're very busy. Um, so let's see. I'm, not, I'm not that good with Vietnamese <laughs> either. Um, a lot of the times when, uh, when I know what a Vietnamese teacher is talking about, um, I'm getting better with the language, uh, but a lot of the times it's because I've already read that text in English. And as soon as, um, as soon as like the name is dropped of the commentator or, and I catch on just a few things of what is being discussed, I go, oh, I know exactly what text that is. So I know what this, and that helps me understand a little bit more of the language because I know what's being discussed. But um, so uh, I, I would say that particular talk is, is sort of a lot of that information is already available in, in English, but it's mostly been a scholarly type of focus to, to look at like the context from which Buddhism arose. And, and the like internal debates between different schools. But, uh, but this context, I think is also really important to, to understand the, our understanding of, of Buddhism today and the way that all of these traditions have sort of, um, because there, I, I say there's not a lot of sectarianism anymore uh, in practice, but historically it seems like there, there was quite a bit and it took a long, long time for for all of these divergent views to find a way to like, oh, I understand what you're saying now. And I understand how, why it doesn't contradict uh, the Dharma. Right. So we, we eventually got to this position of um, like all Mahayana schools basically believing the same thing. All these Theravada schools basically believing the same thing. Uh, and without having that earlier context of who was debating who and who believed what, I think it, it's a little bit more difficult to, to understand um, these, uh, the Dharma as, it, as it's presented to us today. Uh, so, um, I, I don't know. It, I would like other people to, to translate uh, more of Tung work or just more Vietnamese works in general. Um, there's a text called the Hua Lu Luck, uh, Instructions on Emptiness, that is a, uh, that I would love to see someone translate. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe give me like 10 years to like learn my first language again. <laughs> so I know we're really close to the end of time. Um, I'm going to just read a couple more questions that are in the chat and we'll see if we can squeeze in one more question. Um, Ting asks, can you speak to the resistance of Western Buddhism to the practice of repentance slash respect for the Vinaya? Oh no, there's so many questions. Okay, um, I'm just gonna name these questions because I do love just like lifting these questions and maybe you can choose something that you feel moved to respond to for this last question. Um, so Hua writes, uh, as you highlighted, accurate authentic translation is vital when it comes to reading original texts. What are some ways to determine the quality of translation and how to locate such texts? And Sean writes, how does a turn toward traditionalism mesh or clash with innovation in Asian Buddhism, both in interpretation and technological translation transmission, which is also historically factual and an ongoing cultural trend. Sorry, that was a lot. Um, to the first question, uh, I, don't, I don't think my answer will be well liked, but mm, I would say read every translation and then compare them. <laughs> but uh, I just think that's fun. 
<laughs> but um, otherwise, I'm I'm not really sure that I, I would say you can get to certain translators that you like, but um, I think the only way to really assess if something is super accurate is to at least look at a couple of different copies. Um, and hopefully, hopefully no one is trying to um, forge something, but it, it clearly happens. The second question, um, I don't think advancement in technology or our, our cultural worldview in general is necessarily a, uh, in opposition to Buddhist traditionalism. Because if we are honest about assessing things in terms of um, causes and conditions, there is a certain primacy we have to give to the consideration of material causes and conditions because they, in, in a world where material resources are not uh, adequately met for all populations, the primary concern of a people and the primary cause of suffering is always going to be those material resources first. So um, a study of materialism and um, presenting solutions to the problem of suffering in material and technological ways, uh, I don't think that is in opposition to the idea that all of reality is actually made of mind because the material layer of this mind-made reality is still really important. Mm. And I think too, I, I'm sure there might be even more questions in this space. I know on the website for this webinar, on you have an email address. So I think people who might want to reach out to An would be welcome to email him there. And I think just this is a really nice note to end on. There's just a comment that I want to read from Luan, who writes, um, Gamun, on, on for your scholarly knowledge and sharing tonight. My heart is smiling at your affirming of our beloved teacher Tai Nhat Hanh's discipline approach with the Dharma's interpretation to be accurate and represented. I especially liked the understanding of Vietnam's history, touching upon the nostalgic attachment to the colonial past, thus the continued use of the old flag, which helped me to look deeply at the older generations. So I hope everyone will join me in thinking on this is so rich and I feel we could talk for longer, but I also want to respect everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you, Chenzing. Thank you, An. What an amazing evening. I know we've all gotten so much out of it. Um, we'll finish with the bell. Adriana, did you want to say anything? No, thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. I was just going to tell you how this topic also connected too much with a person from Mexico like myself who has lived colonialization in our culture and syncretism and it speaks so clearly and the and the role that I have in continuing this colonization so thank you because it was learning of your culture and Buddhism and also about mine so thank you so much it was really great thank you Thank you all. And after the bell, we'll have a couple of quick announcements and then we finish. And from the time we spent here together, may all of us here and all beings everywhere live with ease and freedom and health and safety and well being. And may all beings wake up together so that we may all be free. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Don, for the captions. Thank you, um, Rachel and Claire, who are here for social media support. Tenzing, of course, for curating this ama amazing series. And um, Adriana, of course, for co-organizing with me.
Um, and again, Ann, thank you, thank you so much. So uh, thank all of you. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so one uh, announcement is that we don't yet have our um, next series up yet, but please 